just to begin with maybe the obvious, that we're going through the most profound change in communication technologies in all of human history, uh, but really accelerated in a short period of time. And, and I say that full cognition of all the great technological changes that have gone on throughout history that have had you know, really far-reaching implications for society, for, for politics, for identity. But I really believe the one we're going through now is uh, breathtakingly fast and, and far-reaching in ways that it's very difficult for even those of us who spend all of our time studying it to fully uh, comprehend. Um, and at, at the heart of it, there are many different characteristics of it, but I think for me, and, and really the subject of the talk today, is about the extent to which data, information, if you will, uh, that we used to keep private, that we used to keep in our desktops, in our filing cabinets, in our heads, uh, that we now share with third parties. And most of those are third parties that are private companies, Many of them are headquartered in jurisdictions other than the ones that we're citizens of. Um, so we're effectively uh, turning our lives inside out. Uh, that to me is the core of what's uh, going on right now. Um, and I think you know this turning ourselves inside out, something we, we haven't been forced to do, right? It's something that we've uh, wittingly done. We participate in it in exchange for uh, a lot of the services that we're given for free. But a lot of it is unwitting. Uh, and this is, I think, part of the core of the argument, but I hope to encourage you all to do more of, is that there's a lot going on beneath the surface that uh, we're unconscious of, typically, generally, as consumers, as citizens. And yet it's the stuff that's going on beneath the surface that is um, perhaps the most important. Now, I'll say a word quickly about surveillance. So, Surveillance, uh, this is not a talk that's against surveillance. I think uh, you, surveillance is part of our nature as a species. It's what we do. We observe the world around us. We look out for threats. Surveillance can be very good. Uh, we need surveillance in order to understand the world around us, to mitigate problems like climate change. Um, so surveillance in and of itself it is not uh, necessarily the problem. However, uh, as part of this explosion that's going on, this revolution that we're living in, is a, is a combination that may have some pretty potent unintended consequences. And that is the combination of surveillance with this digital technology and a model of uh, exchange, the personal surveillance capitalism market. So that together, I think, is, is why we're in the situation that we're in, and it's going to require some thinking. Um, I like to think that we're kind of in the middle of a hurricane. And when you're in the middle of a hurricane, it's hard to get your bearings and figure out what's going on, because things are happening so fast. And, and um, at best, I think what we can do, researchers uh, such as myself, is try to get some you know, anchors down, some tent posts, and try to maybe slow things down a bit and say, OK, these are the things that are going on. These are the bits of evidence that we have to concern ourselves with in order to uh, identify the risks uh, that are out there and start to think about ways to mitigate them. Um, so in the first part of my talk, I'm just going to go through. Uh, I, I titled it after Mr. Rogers. I'm you know, trying to be a bit clever here. These are the sensors in my neighborhood. I'm not going to be exhaustive. I just want to go through. And these are, honestly, these aren't even things that relate necessarily to citizen lab research. They're things that I observe as part of my daily life and my professional interests over the last uh, couple of decades. <clears throat> and then after going through this, I want to talk about what we can start to do, how we should approach this uh, with ethics in mind. And, and I think, for me, I often get asked in presentations uh, that I give, uh, people uh, come away usually, if I'm talking especially about citizen lab research, which tends to be uh, about uh, scary things, bad actors undertaking some dangerous stuff around the world. Uh, people come away and they usually say, I want to throw my phone in Lake Ontario and completely <laughs> unplug. And I, I don't think that's uh, viable. I don't even think it's desirable. I think that the solution here can't be to rewind, to go back to a different time, to unplug. Uh, not only is, is that impossible, I think it's actually counterproductive. Instead, what we have to do is approach the technological environment that we live in that includes so many wonderful aspects 
with a different frame of mind, uh, with a different governance uh, setup. And, and I think that's really the hard part and maybe the most interesting part of the conversation that we can have today. Well, what does that mean? It's easier said than, than done. Uh, so let me go through uh, some of these. And you know, if you're talking about neighborhoods, this may be a curious place to begin, but Marshall McLuhan, after all, said we live in a global village. So for me, if you're talking about sensors in the neighborhood, you have to begin in near Earth orbital space and talk about the number of satellites that orbit the planet. But you can actually go to this website. It's an interactive database of all the satellites that are orbiting the Earth. And you can click on any one of those little white dots or all the satellites in orbit. There are roughly around 2,000 Earth orbiting satellites uh, today as we speak. <clears throat> many of them are used for communications. Many of, many of them are used for navigation, GPS, and so on. A lot of them are also used for Earth remote sensing. And this is actually an area that private interests of mine. So going back uh, many decades ago, I started studying information technology and international security issues. One of the first areas I got into was uh, satellite reconnaissance. And at the time, if you wanted to purchase as a consumer satellite images of the Earth from space, there were regulations that prevented companies from selling uh, images uh, below a certain threshold. Roughly 10 meter resolution was the, the limit in the, in the 1980s. Um, and, and most of the really powerful stuff was uh, classified. <clears throat> uh, typically the United States, Soviet Union, China, France, UK, a couple other countries had very high resolution satellites that could resolve things down to the uh, level of centimeters. Um, now, think as part of the revolution that we're living, this picture has entirely changed. One among many companies is this company Planet. That's the satellite, uh, the Earth observation satellite, uh, as part of their um, product offering. They have about 150 of these in space right now, as we speak, uh, that are taking images of the Earth, uh, two images per second, each of those 150 satellites. And the resolution is uh, on the order of spy satellite imagery from the 1980s, less than one meter resolution, about point six meter uh, resolution. Within a single day, they can take images of the entire landmass of, of, the, of the Earth, which is just absolutely phenomenal. And you can purchase the imagery if you want to. So we can see things from space like this, which is um, China's construction of an artificial island in, in South China Sea. So arms control people, people who study strategic issues, very important technology. This is North Korea, so you can look at um, you know, change detection here, uh, vehicles, equipment, uh, things going on in a particular facility that show preparations for a nuclear test. Uh, here's another example of change detection. So go, going back in the archives, as you can now, to 2011 in Iraq, you can see an Iraqi army base. In 2017, it was taken over by ISIS. And of course, you can see the whole base is destroyed, but what they've done is set up this former Iraqi military base as an oil refinery. Uh, for those of you um, who don't know, ISIS uh, generated a lot of revenue through oil production, and uh, this is uh, one example of that. So we can see uh, many things uh, about what's going on on the planet uh, from outer space. And I think outer space, and for thinking about the senses in our neighborhood, this is kind of the outer boundary that we need to talk about. And funnily enough, most people don't really think about that. I think it's really historically quite amazing that we have this uh, perspective on the entire planet. Um, then there's aerial surveillance, uh, you know, literally airplane surveillance, but also commercial drones now. Um, and hey, there we are, right here. On a, on a nicer day, um, this is from a commercial drone that we bought Best Buy, um, and uh, wonderful resolution. You can see here, I think we might be exceeding the uh, altitude limit that's supposed to be hardwired into this particular commercial drone. Um, nonetheless, uh, we were experimenting with this outside of the lab, and uh, there are tens of thousands of these now. You could go out and buy one yourself today if you wanted to from Best Buy. Um, why were we at Citizen Lab interested in it? Well, if you look at the uh, 
terms of service of this particular drone, which is manufactured by DGI. The way you control the drone, by the way, is through an application on your phone. So you actually have uh, the phone uh, has an application that interacts with the drone, and so you um, connect to it, and then the drone application sends data back to the company that is the manufacturer of the drone. And so in the terms of service, you see they collect a lot of information about you and your device, your device ID that's hardwired into the phone, uh, the geolocation of the phone, information about any photo or video recorded. They give themselves permission to extract all of that. Um, certain features about GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and down here may be provided by a third party or to a third party. Um, this is not uncommon, by the way. This is part of this, um, you know, turning ourselves inside out and sharing information with third parties. So it's not just the manufacturer of the drone application, of the drone that we're sharing the information with. It's all of the third parties that they're sharing that information with. Most of them, we have no idea uh, what's going on. We also, by the way, one of the things we do at Citizen Lab with very, very uh, smart technical people who reverse engineer applications, effectively break them, or also stress test them in, in controlled network conditions. So we'll look at the network traffic. And we found in an earlier version of the drone that, that um, it was sending uh, uh, confidential, you might say, uh, identifi personally identifiable information about our devices in the clear. And we could also, as you can see by the prior clip that I showed, we could uh, mess with the system to change the altitude settings. They're supposed to be hardwired to prevent you from, say, exceeding a certain limit or going into restricted areas like airports, but we found we could actually manipulate that. And since we did those experiments, the manufacturer upgraded the software uh, so that we didn't end up publishing on it. Uh, they beat us to the punch. Um, now, this company, DGI, which is the world's uh, leading provider of commercial drones happens to be a Chinese company. And that's very important. Not because uh, necessarily of the concerns you might hear in the media, often in the context of, say, Canadian national security, American national security, oh, we have to worry about the Chinese spying on us. It's more to do with something a bit different. In China, they have a cybersecurity uh, law that was actually passed last year that requires all companies that operate in China to share all of the data they collect with security services upon request, right? Um, so that, that that is simply a function. You know, to operate legally in that country, you have to do that. So everything that this uh, company is taking from all of those tens of thousands of consumers who are using these drones to do environmental mapping, humanitarian missions, sensitive military missions, uh, maybe you're involved in a protest and you have a drone. You saw drones in the, in the recent gathering of the, the students in Washington, D.C. All of that information goes back to this Chinese company and potentially uh, shared with Chinese security services. That's a very important, I think, meta point to understand about all of this uh, data sharing is that the relationship between all those private companies we share the data with, the third parties that they share it with, and the state. What is the relationship between them? Well, in China, you have the extreme example, right? They simply created a law, companies have to abide by it. Going back and looking at Earth again, this is, of course, a graphic, but uh, what we see here are all the undersea cables. Uh, this is also an interactive map, so you could go click on it, and you could see the name of the cable. Um, I find that most people, when they think about the internet and cyberspace and digital technology, it's kind of like this mysterious, magical thing that just works, and most people don't really uh, think much, or, or they take for granted this vast physical infrastructure of cyberspace. And you know, I mentioned the satellites before and the communication satellites, but they play a relatively minor role in the routing of, of all telecommunications traffic worldwide. Most of it is actually routed through undersea cables, right? So there is a very physical infrastructure that actually is very banal, right? There's, there's a cable laying operation. Cables occasionally are severed, not uh, by intention, but because they're rubbing against rocks under the, under the ocean. And so a cable 
uh, severing that way can often lead to mass outages of the internet uh, all around the world. I find it uh, very fascinating to focus on the physical infrastructure, not just out of curiosity, but I think if you follow the leads, it can often reveal some very interesting things. So where these uh, cables end up converging or landing uh, is, is important to understand. Um, this is what's known as an internet exchange point. Uh, in most cities, there are internet exchange points, IXPs. Uh, this is where major telecommunications companies and internet service providers peer their traffic. So they're important for that reason as a kind of choke point in the internet. If you're thinking about, well, how do I control information? You know, if you think about it as this mysterious, amorphous thing, it can be pretty difficult to think about strategically. How would I control information? But if you look at the physical infrastructure, there are some very important choke points where information kind of terminates or appears. And that is definitely the case with internet exchange points. This one is really interesting because it is a, an AT&T building in downtown Manhattan called the Long Line Building. Do you notice it has no windows whatsoever? I mean, how many people have walked along Manhattan past this building and maybe stop and go, what the heck's in that building? Uh, in fact, if they had done some interrogation, they would have found out that there was a national security agency operation in this uh, AT&T building. The U.S. Signals Intelligence Agency had set up a vast wiretapping system. So all the cables coming into Manhattan Island uh, terminate in this internet exchange point and then go off into Manhattan. And the United States government had a secret uh, wiretapping operation in that facility. If you're interested in that, uh, Laura Poitras, the documentary filmmaker who did, you know, related to Snowden, Edward Snowden disclosures, where this came from, she did a short documentary on this that's really phenomenal. It's like a 12, 15 minute long documentary. I encourage you to look at it. There's an internet exchange point uh, on, in Toronto, if you're interested, 151 Front Street. Happens to be next to uh, CSIS headquarters. In <laughs> Coincidence, perhaps. <laughs> if you go inside, this is what they look like. Long racks of servers and equipment, cables terminating up. So this is the, you know, the, the, the internet is not a seamless, amorphous, distributed network. It is instead a series of choke points and filters. And it's at those choke points and filters where uh, interception takes place, where information control is exercised by authorities. Most of this is in the hands of the private sector, of course, um, which is why, again, the relationship between the private sector and the state is very important to understand in this context. Under what circumstances can the RCMP go into 151 Front Street and just start wiretapping all of this? I mean, putting a a tap on one of those cables and then sending it to law enforcement. That's a very important, not only privacy issue, public policy issue, security issue. <clears throat> it's just a graphic to underscore the point about you know these devices that we all carry around in our pockets. I'm imagining every single person in this room has one of these right now, uh, even when we're not using it. I like to remind people that it's a, it's emitting a radio signal every few seconds as a beacon to the nearest cell phone tower or router, wherever it is in this room. Usually it's in the ceiling somewhere. <clears throat> Maybe it's behind the wall. And if you begin to take it apart as well, there are all these different layers to, to this tiny device. The applications, of course, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Most of us have within our devices several dozen applications constantly uploading applications, removing them, new ones. When you go to an event, maybe you're encouraged to upload an application. Um, this is where users spend most of their time, and for that reason, they're very important to understand. Uh, applications give themselves permissions. Most people don't read the terms of service of the applications they install. Um, but if you do, you might be surprised to find out what permissions they're giving themselves. Uh, at Citizen Lab, we also break applications. We reverse engineer them. I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, but what you find when you actually rip them apart, look at what's going on inside the application, how it handles information, what it's giving itself permission, sometimes it doesn't match up with the terms of service. 
So you can only discover it by breaking it and reverse engineering it. I find that very interesting. There's the operating system, of course, the hardware, all the components, a SIM card, uh, which is a very powerful identification technology that's embedded in your phone. Um, and of course, the connectivity, how we connect to the internet, to each other. Again, it doesn't happen through the ether. It's not like these radio signals just go off to nowhere. They connect to a Wi-Fi router or to a cell phone tower. Uh, my family, my kids, they think I'm crazy because I'm always pointing out cell phone towers. And I have a private Instagram feed that's mostly my images of cell phone towers around the city. And the students who, who have taken my class, they'll know that I tell them, okay, I think in the first class, I want you to go out and take pictures and look at all the cell phone towers. I find them fascinating. They're all over the place. They're part of our landscape. This is a great building uh, down near the lakeshore, uh, in Carlaw, I think. Uh, look at that. I mean, this building basically is, its function, its purpose is now to, to host these uh, cell towers. There are cell maps. Uh, that you can look at, where you can, that are, that are crowdsourced, that tell you which companies have leased these towers. And of course, they're also very important choke points because the data that you shall share with the cell tower and the cell provider tells a lot about you. Uh, this is from a Citizen Lab project where we made a request to Fido Rogers, and uh, under privacy laws, your, your, um, Legally, you have a right to make such a request to find out, hey, tell me all the data you have about me. And the companies have to give it back to you. I'll be talking about this at the, at the end of my presentation in a bit more detail. <clears throat> but for now, this is just about the cell tower data that we got back when one of our researchers made this request. And what he was able to do is take all of the cell tower dump that they had about him. And you can see, <clears throat> based on, you know, this is. Uh, I guess a typical Citizen Lab staff member. He doesn't have much of a life beyond <laughs> he's up at the Citizen Lab and down here in non-business hours. And when I first saw this, I said to him, and you can't see it on the resolution here, but I guess this is where his house is, but I noticed there's an LCBO right there. I thought, I'm worried maybe you have a drinking problem. But it was actually his residence. But you know, if, if as a citizen, as a consumer, you can make this request, you can understand why law enforcement, why the government uh, would want to have this information. So it's very important that we put conditions around when the companies share that information with law enforcement, with other uh, companies, without our permission. Sometimes they don't even go to the cell companies. Uh, this is very interesting technology uh, known by a variety of names, MC Capture, Stingray, uh, this is a fake cell tower technology that the police use. Um, so what it does is when they turn it on, if you're in the vicinity with your cell phone, it automatically captures, effectively hijacks the signal because of, of, of whoever is within proximity. Um, and it forces a connection based on the power of the signal. So you could set this up you know, here in this room and if I was doing that, all of your uh, cell phones would automatically collect to this. And then I would be able to, depending on the system I was using, collect information about your cell phone that I could use to then track you, like the, the, the hardwired information in your cell phone, the device ID number, SIM card information. In some cases, I could even collect your text messages and phone calls through that interception. Um, we suspected that the police in Canada were using this. If you go back and look at Citizen Lab reports from many years ago, we started talking about this and there were news articles about it. Lo and behold, it turns out now that they have been using it, they were not being forthcoming. Uh, they were using different code words for this technology, but it's been used routinely uh, throughout Canada, throughout uh, the world, in fact, by law enforcement agencies. They actually have public safety uh, considerations around their use because if I did set up something like that in this room, hijack all your phones, you wouldn't be able to make a 911 call, right? So if police are doing this in a large urban center for whatever reason, there are serious public safety considerations in addition to the privacy risks. <clears throat> uh, this is an Israeli company, Celebrate. 
they sell to law enforcement and intelligence agencies this type of system which can be used to unlock a phone and, and extract all sorts of data. Um, kind of perversely, as a consequence of the Snowden revelations, uh, a lot of the uh, techniques of law enforcement have been driven in this direction, to get inside the device. Because <clears throat> prior to the Snowden revelations, uh, signals intelligence agencies were mostly focused on capturing network traffic, right? So they gather up in, uh, information, data as it flows through the networks and analyze it. And you wouldn't know what was going on, but they could intercept and, and read everything. After the Snowden disclosures, a lot of the companies that we rely on, like Google, Facebook, others, started putting in place end-to-end -end encryption, making that traffic much less useful. So uh, while it protected all of us from traffic interception, from network traffic monitoring, what it did was push law enforcement intelligence agencies in the direction of getting inside the device. Now typically most law enforcement intelligence agencies, they don't do this themselves, they go contract out to large companies like Celebrate that make billions of dollars providing this type of assistance. Okay, so this, this one, very simple, they just plug it in, it takes off all sorts of information off the device. Just today, there's a story about our colleagues in London, Privacy International. They came out with a survey they did. It turns out in the United Kingdom, police all through, all through England have been routinely using this without a warrant. So they'll stop people, they'll take their device, suck all the data out of it, and give the device back. Right? So uh, this is highly invasive technology. For the police to be using it without a warrant is a severe violation of privacy rights. <clears throat> uh, so you see Wi-Fi hotspots all over the place. Uh, be very, very careful, of course, about using a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, you know, anybody that operates a Wi-Fi hotspot can see everything that you're doing online, which is why it's very important to ha have a concern about digital hygiene when you use these. I would never log on to a Tim Hortons Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi free hotspot somewhere. In New York, uh, they have these free Wi-Fi hotspots that have been built all through Manhattan. When they first came out, there were a few problems with them. One was that a lot of people started just surfing porn in the middle of the street and masturbating. So they said, okay, we got to put some filters on here to prevent that from happening. Typical kind of New York thing. Um, but they were also collecting a ton of data. So you could use it to charge your phone, and then they would extract all sorts of data about your phone, share it with advertisers. Like, the, the, you know, nothing's free. There's no free lunch. So the idea of this free Wi-Fi hotspot is actually to extract as much information out of you while you're using this free system, and then generate revenue from it. Uh, keep that in mind as you uh, log into a free Wi-Fi hotspot. Well, hey, we can't uh, have this discussion without Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, perfect timing. We almost engineered it for this <laughs> today. Um, I find this kind of frustrating in a way because I feel like it's one of those I told you so moments. You know, I've been talking about this stuff for a long time, but you shouldn't let ego get in the way. I think maybe this will be a important uh, learning moment for a lot of people when they begin to finally understand oh, oh my god like you know all these permissions that I'm giving you know this is from a few years ago the iPhoto application on Facebook the level of permission that you're granting and most people don't look at this but you know your friends photos your friends religious and political views your friends videos and so on. so what what the Cambridge analytic uh, episode is not unusual there's really nothing unique about it it wasn't a breach, as many people have pointed out. It's how the system is designed, right? And Cambridge Analytica is actually probably a real garbage company. I don't even believe they had any influence over anything. Uh, but as a constellation of a uh, variety of circumstances, they're in the news now. We're hearing about it. But there are tens of thousands of companies that are doing this sort of thing. It's part of the bargain that we've entered into uh, for free services in exchange. But it's very important, of course, to, to look at your the services, the permissions you're granting. Um, this is wonderful. I love this visualization that a colleague of mine did. 
<clears throat> uh, she looked at PayPal, and PayPal shares data with a lot of third companies, right? Um, and there are so many third-party companies you can't even see them on this visualization, right? Um, as part of the new European data privacy regulations that are, have come into effect, the GDPR, PayPal has had to disclose the number of third parties that they share your information with. There are 650 individual companies that they share information with. So this uh, person did a, a graphic where you can expand and look at all of these. And again, if you just Google that, you'll, you'll see that yourself. It's interactive and very interesting. Same thing happens when we surf the web. Cookies, trackers, ad trackers. Um, if you visit NFL.com, just to give you one example, these are all the third-party tracker sites that track your website, your history, and so on. It's part of the nature of, you know, there was a time I remember uh, early on in the internet where, where people would wonder, how is anyone going to ever make money on the internet? Everything's free. And there's a, this funny debate that was happening for a while. You know, you can never make money because you know, people want free stuff. Well, the, what was happening underneath the surface was that all of this uh, tracking was going on and, and the revenues are derived from monitoring everything you do, monitoring everything about you, monitoring your habits, your social relationships, your preferences, your interests, and then pushing advertisement back at you. And that's how the money is made. And of course, there's a whole secondary market around that as well. Uh, a couple years ago, we did a study of fitness trackers at the Citizen Lab. And I'll just point out a few things. Again, not that unusual, but I, I thought this was uh, pretty revealing. So we took eight of the most popular fitness trackers, carefully examined their terms of service and privacy policies. We reverse engineered the applications. We ran them under controlled conditions in the lab, monitored the network traffic. And what we found that uh, was that uh, almost all of them, with the exception of the Apple product, uh, were uh, uh, sending information, first of all, collecting a lot of fine grain information about your device, about you, about your location, about your movements and so on. That's understandable, I suppose. But most of them were sending it in a very insecure manner. So if I set up a Wi-Fi hotspot, you happen to come by with your fitness tracker, I could gather a lot of information about uh, who you are, where you've been, and what you're doing, simply by the fact that you have this fit fitness tracker going, uh, operating. Um, we also were able to manipulate the, um, the communications between the fitness tracker app and the server of the company, in one case, to show that we had done a billion steps in an hour. And that, that was quite interesting because uh, some of you may know fitness tracker data is now being uh, entered into court cases, right? So to be able to manipulate data to show we were here instead of there, uh, that's very important. We did responsible disclosure to all the companies and now most of this has been fixed in terms of the security issue, but not the privacy stuff. Like they fixed it so that they're not sending data in the clear, but they're still collecting all that data about you. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, example, I think, kind of like Cambridge Analytica in a way. Uh, how many people heard of the Strava heat map? Okay, so quite a few people. So th this is like a social network of, of fitness people. And you can upload all of your fitness tracking information to Strava and, and, they, and you know, share with people your running routes and all of that. They released this heat map of all of their data and it was really cool. Like you can see all the runners everywhere, all the people who have been exercising all over the world. And the first thing people did, including one of the citizen lab researchers, is go, well, there's some parts of this heat map that are kind of curious in like Western Sahara, Africa. So we saw like a couple of dark, you know, big dark parts of the map with a couple of things and zoomed in and realized actually what this is is a secret military base. And that's the uh, people doing their exercises in the base in the middle of the desert. So we were able to identify uh, through the uh, publicly released information that Strava had a series of secret military bases. I think I have another one. This is a Russian military base in Syria. You know, you can't leave the base, so you got to run around in circles, and that's why you see the concentration of the heat map. Um, why this is interesting? Because 
okay, they published this information, that's one thing, and, and a few clever people were able to point this out. But the bigger issue here is kind of a, a symptom of a larger problem or challenge we face is that, you know, whether it's fitness trackers or anything else, we're giving this information to these companies. A lot of that information is highly invasive, raises security issues, privacy issues. With whom are they sharing that data? And under what conditions is the important uh, question. Because had this not been released publicly, and let's say, you know, uh, Russian cyber hackers have been able to get inside the company's data, they would have been able to see all of these secret military bases by inferring from the patterns in the same way we did. Or if uh, the FBI made a lawful access request, give us all your data about what's going on in Syria, they would be able to see uh, Russian military bases. You can you know, increase the number of examples along those lines. Oh, presto, it's so <laughs> wonderful. I use it all the time to tap, it's convenient. Those stupid tokens, I don't have to worry, where's my token, do I have two? No, I've got Presto now. And the first thing I thought about was about this was, geez, that's a lot of highly revealing, sensitive information about commuters in the city. I wonder to what degree they're protecting that information. Again, it's one of those stories. It turns out that uh, they were kind of loose with it. Police uh, were asking for that information. People at Presto felt they're doing a civic duty, I guess, by handing it over. Um, and in a lot of cases, not with a warrant, right? So that's a big problem if that, that, that's not being followed. Fortunately now, uh, Presto, Metrolinx, they've got a transparency report. So you can go and look, I was looking at, I think it was the first one was just released earlier this month. And it shows the number of requests that they get from law enforcement. Um, so transparency reports are good. They're not, you know, it's not the solution to all of this, but we would like companies to be more transparent about when they share our data with lawful authorities and under what conditions. So transparency reports are a way for them to report to the public. Here's how often this has happened. Here's how, how many times with the warrant. You know, there are sensors all over the place. The, the surveillance cameras now, there's so many of them uh, they're almost hidden from view, right? We take them for granted. Uh, when I first was working in this area, I can recall uh, when I was first hired here in, in 1996, I got to know the work of Professor Steve Mann. How many people know Steve Mann? <clears throat> Wonderful colleague, really creative guy. Uh, back then, he was really into surveillance. It was the first time I heard that term, which is to watch from below. And he was encouraging people, at that time they didn't really have cameras on their smartphones and their cell phones. He was encouraging people to take videos or still photos of surveillance cameras where they saw it. And I thought that was wonderful. I, I really thought it was a very imaginative way to encourage people to think about uh, the extent to which they're under surveillance as they go about their daily lives. But now, of course, these things are, are all over the place, taken for granted. Uh, wherever you have that, you know, you have this on the other side, so somebody watching uh, what we're doing, um, and it's getting more and more integrated with our purchasing. Uh, this is at Home Depot. I don't know if anyone's been to Home Depot. When you make a purchase, there's a picture of you making this purchase, so there's some kind of facial recognition being integrated with the purchase. Uh, if you go to the extreme, you go to China, uh, where they are investing billions of dollars in artificial intelligence, facial recognition, biometrics, distributed surveillance systems. Uh, they have uh, the facial recognition that the police use on their eyeglasses. I think this is like a weird doppelganger homage to Steve Mann because the other thing he's known for is the wearable computing. They got smaller and smaller over time. So this is like, you know, the Star Trek episode. You go to China and they're wearing Steve Mann's glasses to observe security risks. Um, I should say in China, you know, I'm not really talking about it here in this presentation, but as part of Citizen Lab's work, we routinely reverse engineer and interrogate ch Chinese applications, popular live streaming applications, chat applications. They are interesting to us. They're kind of low hanging fruit because, as I said earlier, by law, they're all required to uh, turn over user data uh, to authorities upon request. 
So they're incentivized to effectively police their customers and almost all of them have some kind of content filtering or surveillance built into the application. So for us, it's a neat way to kind of compare our applications and look at what's going on. China is the future. It's one possible future. Uh, and we need to ask, is that, is that where we want to go? Um, the other thing I'll say about China, there was a time, when I, again, when I first started out in this area, uh, everyone, there was a conventional wisdom that the internet, digital technologies would bring about the end of authoritarian rule. Governments like China, they're just you know, too slow and plodding, these old authoritarian leaders in this fast-paced you know, uh, digital media environment. Well, it actually it looks to be the opposite is the case. A very scary prospect there. And of course, the world is sliding back into authoritarianism uh, at the very same time that this is going on. Internet of Things. Like this is now, um, we're uh, taking you know, the, the, the microcosm of all that I've been talking about and just like exploding it in our homes, right? So we have our dishwashers, our blenders, our kettles, baby monitors, um, all of them monitoring us while making our lives easier as part of this exchange. And they're all doing all the things that I've been talking about inside the home, right? And you know, shower and washing shower and washing machine yeah and an oven as well there you go um there is actually a really good uh a, a journalist whose name escapes me right now um put her home under she bought as many of these devices as she could for herself and then uh, had some technical friends come and, and monitor the network traffic it's really an illuminating article because all of these devices they're talking to their home base Right? They're, even when you're not using them, they're constantly uh, you know, updating and, and monitoring what's going on. Um, so highly invasive. Again, none of this is being forced upon us, right? But it's, uh, there it is. Oh, and then there's sidewalk labs. Um, we're going to build uh, the, the uh, harbor front from the internet up, I think is the, the uh, is, that, is that the catchphrase that they use? They changed it last week. Oh, they changed it last week, yeah. Um, so, you know, I had a debate with a colleague last night about this, and she thought it was something that, you know, this could, if it works out well, it could be a model. Perhaps that's true. I really think we need to have our radar up, you know, that's, that's what I said. We really got to be worried about this, you know, if we're thinking about the ethics and the city and all this topic, you know, here, here it is, okay, this is what's, what's coming before us. This is like, you know, the, the home, the Internet of Things, except a neighborhood. Um, to me, it kind of smacks a, of digital high modernism. It's got this utopia uh, around it, a uh, vision of a future that everything is clean and intelligent and smart. And I really worry, you know, never, nothing ever seems to work out that way. Uh, they're not in it for the public good. They wouldn't be doing it if they we're in it for the public good. They're in it for private gain. Perhaps there could be a nice balance between private gain and public good. That's that's the challenge for the citizens of Toronto. So let me conclude uh, with a couple sort of, you know, well, what can we do about all of this? First thing, you know, what can governments do? Uh, I think there there is a lot and a lot of regulation that. that uh, probably could and should be promoted in this area. Um, I think it's really strange to me. Uh, I've spent a lot of time studying cybersecurity, and, and this is about you know securing all of this technology. Uh, and for the last 20 years, what's happened is that the responsibility to secure cyberspace has mostly been deferred to the intelligence agencies, the law enforcement agencies, the military agencies. That's just one possible path we could go down, but that's where we're going down for some reason. And I, I find that an unfortunate choice. I think it's counterproductive in so many ways. Uh, these are, think about signals intelligence agencies, like our own communication security establishment. How many people know of the CSE in this room? Not that many. Okay, wow. Uh, how many people know of the NSA? Okay, so the, you know this is our NSA, right? It's it's the 
uh, it's the agency that was uh, born in you know World War II, uh, whose job it was to collect signals to and, and mostly vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union to anticipate you know is there going to be a ballistic missile launch and we need to you know listen in on the Kremlin. Um, equivalent to uh, the United States and, and UK GCHQ were part of the Five Eyes Alliance. Uh, these agencies were born in the shadows in the Cold War. They are um, adjuncts of the military. They're really from the military realm, highly secretive agencies. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, when the threat paradigm changed and uh, it became all of society, uh, the mission of these agencies changed as well. It was no longer them focusing on each other in a kind of state versus state thing. They're now focused on all of society. And they have very powerful interception capabilities. They're usually granted wide leeway in terms of what they can collect, including, say, tapping into undersea cables or internet exchange points. Um, so we've uh, deferred responsibility or granted responsibility to these agencies at the very same time that we're turning our lives inside out and leaving this digital exhaust everywhere we go. Um, that to me is a bad combination. Most of the things that we think about as cybersecurity problems could be much better dealt with as civilian issues. And when I think about you know, what governments could be doing more of when we think about regulation, I'm not thinking about giving more money and power to the spies which is the way kind of it's being thought of now. Uh, this CSE's budget has quadrupled since 9-11. It's got like vast resources and capabilities. We need to be giving uh, uh, resources and powers to privacy commissioners, to people that will look out for us and actually be able to levy very stiff fines against companies when they breach our privacy or when there's a data breach. Uh, companies can get away with all sorts of stuff without there being any punishment for it on behalf of consumers. That's how we should be thinking about what governments can do. At the same time, we need to restrain governments themselves, right? So we need to be thinking about checks and balances and oversight mechanisms because there's a very uh, dangerous and growing repository of data that governments can tap into from these companies about our lives. If we want liberal democracy to survive, we have to have checks and balances around what governments can do. I think we have to really be concerned about the pressure right now at this moment for social media to be regulated. Um, I have big concerns about this. I understand where it's coming from. So people say, hey, Facebook, oh, the, you know, they should have, they should have policed that Russian disinformation and prevented those publications from having all of that. Hold on a minute. If you look around the world and you see what's going on in the name of policing fake news, such as in Indonesia, where they have a new law now, which is basically any person who broadcasts fake news or hoaxes resulting in a riot or disturbance shall be punished with, punished with a maximum imprisonment of six years. Um, I look at that and I go, what's a disturbance? You know, is this something critical of the Indonesian government is going to land me in jail for six years? Uh, so we have to be very careful about pushing governments in that direction. Already you can see the trend around the world where this excuse of fake news is being used to implement all sorts of state-led information controls. Uh, what can academics do about this? I, I think here I feel very strongly, I feel very fortunate to be a professor with tenure at the University of Toronto, surrounded by very talented researchers I feel, you know, I don't take it lightly. I feel that I have a moral obligation to do as much as I can and to encourage the people who work alongside me to do as much as we can together to lift the lid on all of this stuff. And I'm very bullish about what we will do at the risk of uh, even some very powerful actors, be they governments or corporations, that want to prevent us from doing uh, what we're doing. Uh, we released a report a couple of weeks ago, if you Google Citizen Lab's website, Bad Traffic. This is about a Canadian company, Sandvine, uh, 
uh, that uh, is now owned by an American company called Procera. They're merged together. Uh, There's a company that sells very powerful surveillance technology. And we found that they were injecting uh, spyware en masse in Turkey, in Syria, and doing similar things in Egypt. Um, as part of the research, we identified a fingerprint for Sandvine devices. Uh, we scanned the entire internet, uh, billions of IP addresses, every internet connected device to zero in on the fingerprint of the Sandvine equipment so we could locate it. And just to make sure, we double checked by purchasing a used uh, Procera box. This is one of their deep packet inspection boxes. We actually bought this off of eBay and we did an experiment on this in a laboratory setting. We never connected it to the internet. Prior to publication, we sent a letter to the company with our technical findings uh, saying, here's how we did it. What's your response? We'll offer to publish in full before we publish our findings. And the response back I got, which you can, if you Google bad traffic, you can see all of these letters back and forth. Instead of responding to me, they sent a letter to President Gertler, Chancellor Wilson, uh, threatening to sue if, we, if the university does this, it's shameful, whatever Debert is, uh, we will destroy, you know, they didn't say destroy you, but it was very <laughs> litigious uh, stuff. And uh, back and forth it went. Uh, I will say this, we're very, very responsible in how we communicate, the stakes are very high. We felt very strongly in in the rightness of what we were doing, ethically, legally, etc., And there was a moment, uh, one of those important moments when push came to shove and the university stood by us. And I felt uh, very proud to be here at the university. It's easy to be cynical about institutions like that, uh, but in this instance, very proud they had our back. I encourage you to look at the last letter that was sent by the outside counsel that the University of Toronto hired to represent itself and, and me, um, uh, responding back to Sandvine, saying that uh, this is research in the public interest. And, and the reason I show this device is because they, they demanded that we give back this device and they refused to give back this device. <laughs> They're not giving back this device. Um, connected to this, uh, um, you know, if you do an image search of hackers, this is what you see. The term has been, uh, it, it's, it's evolved over time. To, to, today it means basically the equivalent of a criminal. If you go back to the original days when the term was invented, it meant something entirely different. It described somebody who had uh, an ethic of experimentation, a curiosity about technology. A hacker was someone who was interested in what's going on beneath the surface, what's happening in here. I don't want to just buy something shrink-wrapped. Um, that ethic, that approach is something that we need to encourage everybody to adopt today. So instead of this being the image and the metaphor of what a hacker is, instead we should think of it, of it as a civic ethic for a democratic society. We all need to be hackers and that's why I think the work that we do at the Citizen Lab, I've described it as a hacker hot house or whatever. Sometimes that gets me in trouble, but I, I feel very strongly about this. This is uh, something that needs to be encouraged. At the very time that we're surrounded by so much technology, we're actually discouraging, especially young people, from understanding what goes on beneath the surface. If I take this phone apart, this iPhone, you know what the term for that is? Jailbreaking. Like that, to me, is a symptom of a much larger disease. What can citizens do? What, what can all of you do? Well, I'll end with a few um, pieces of information, but I think really there's a, a cultural shift that uh, I hope happens um, where we think about data and the communications we in, the environment that we live in kind of like we're starting to think about or should be thinking about the natural environment about our bodies of water, about the forest, about the air we breathe. Uh, this is something that surrounds us, that's part of us, that's part of our identity. Yeah. We need to think about this in a, as, as a form of stewardship uh, rather than something we're just selling and, and we don't care about and people can make money off in exchange for free services. Um, perhaps that will also include 
a different way of thinking about the time we spend on all of this technology a bit more personal restraint much like reduce reuse recycle perhaps there will be a different different ethic towards our personal data that will emerge over time uh, meanwhile let me point you to some resources that I think if you haven't heard about already I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the first is something that we uh, produced uh, last fall I think or is around uh, December called security planner which is a, a portal that provides you with peer-reviewed digital security advice based on questions that, that you're asked about concerns you have technology you're using we assembled some of the world's best digital security experts to answer those questions very easy to use I encourage you all uh, to take a look at that um, when you're browsing the internet and remember the NFL site with all of those trackers there are a few very useful plugins that you can use if you don't already like Ghostry, Privacy Badger uh, here's I just took this a couple of minutes before I came here and a screenshot Toronto Star 22 potential trackers on this page so I have Privacy Badger which is made by EFF which not only shows me all of the trackers but blocks some of the ones the ones that I want to be blocked basically this is about encouraging you not only to know what's going on but to take some ownership over it and to control it as well um, EFF Electronic Frontier Foundation has some pretty great guides that are meant to educate yourself about things you can do in terms of your own digital hygiene um, especially their surveillance self-defense guides and some of the other guides and lastly uh, I will point to this tool and I really want to encourage you all uh, to use this so <clears throat> if you recall earlier in my presentation I showed you the cell phone tower dumps and the map that was made by the citizen lab employee who had the drinking problem no he doesn't he doesn't have a drinking problem but he just he has no life he goes between his house and his citizen lab which is why I love my staff I just, <laughs> um, that information was derived from this tool so in Canada much like other jurisdictions you have a right to go to any company who provides you with a service and say give me all the data that you collect on me uh, tell me with whom you share that data and how often now the problem is that I think most people when they hear that they go well I wouldn't really know how to phrase that or how to ask who to address that to you know if I, do I send it to Rogers email or whatever and what we did is create a very simple portal where you go say you're interested in dating applications fitness trackers telecommunications companies we're going to expand this over time to include a number of different uh, services and applications you simply put in your um, you know your your name and your account information we don't collect any of that on the site and a, uh, a PDF is automatically created put together by our legal experts and it's a very long letter that goes to the privacy office of the company in question when we first released this in 2014 tens of thousands of Canadians used it and the original version of it just had telecommunications companies so uh, the privacy officers the, the lawyers at Rogers and Bell and TELUS were freaking out I actually had one uh, I won't say the company maybe I just kind of almost said it <laughs> never mind <laughs> rewind one of the one of them said uh, actually emailed and said you, you need to stop this this is harassment <laughs> and I said, what do you mean it's harassment I'm just facilitating we are facilitating Canadians private we got a problem with the with what they're doing you know change the law but that's a law they're allowed to do this we're simply facilitating the exercise of your rights so the more that you do this the more that Canadians exercise their rights the more companies will know that you're watching and it is after all your right right so you don't want your right to be lost exercise your right through access my 